Welcome everyone to another of our, our online webinars. What we've been doing, uh, uh, this is number 150 in our, in our series of webinars that we started back in March of 2020. And um, they've been great fun. They've been great tools for a, for a lot of people and um, really uh, 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 fun for all of us to do and, uh, and providing some great content. We have a, um, a uh, special guest today, right, Ravi? We have a yeah. we have a special guest today that uh, Ravi. Uh, I, I joke a little bit. I think he's been here at all of them, but maybe two or three, right? And some of those he's even been even snuck in occasionally on the airplane uh, on the airplane Wi-Fi and watched a little bit of them. So I know he's been around, or in, right. in the middle of Mexico <laughs> in, at the Baja races or something, right? So yeah. uh, Robbie's been here for most of them. And I and uh, but Robbie's going to talk about today is is I have a PDM. Now what? We're going to talk a, a little bit of the, uh, the the bigger picture about the PDM, uh, start off with some of that, and then we're going to jump into some technical things for some of you that uh, want some, some maybe some deeper technical things. Um, we're going to jump into some of the stuff that's really important and what's, uh, and, and, and Robbie has found that is, uh, you know, questions he gets. So we're going to, he'll, he'll jump into some technical stuff as well, but we really wanted to kind of to give a, um, an overview of, of, of the PDM product, kind of what it does for you. You, you have it. Okay. Now what, now what do I do, right? What's my next few steps? And then, uh, with the plan to in the next, uh, in the coming months to do, you know, the, the, uh, a couple more of these PDMs uh, digging into some of these deeper subjects. So you may have some questions, please add them to the question and answer uh, for those of you that are here live. If, um, uh, if, if you're here later, drop them into the, um, into the, the description of the YouTube uh, video below. We're gonna have this, uh, this recording up on, on YouTube just as fast as we can get it uh, later today. And um, uh, anything that we mentioned today, uh, as far as links or, or uh, attachments or things like that, uh, the live folks will be getting links directly in the chat box, but you, uh, you at home watching this later on, uh, all of those links will also be in the description box below. So if, if we mention something, just uh, scroll down and, and, and you can grab those resources there. So I appreciate that very much. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, Robbie, Robbie has been, uh, been working for AIM for uh, quite time. some time, a yeah, long time, as far as he yeah. can remember, right? Uh, since 2008, he's currently AIM, AIM Sports Chief Technology Officer. He has been uh, just a, a long time passion for racing and, and uh, electronics. And, and I've been in this world of motorsports a uh, better part of, well, more than half of my life. And, um, and you can always tell when, you, when you're chatting with people whether or not this is something that they kind of enjoy or this is really what they're, what they're meant to do. And Robbie is one of those that has shown pretty quickly that the the racing and the electronic side of it both are 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 good for him and that which makes it a per perfect fit for him to be here with us uh at aim sports because it's uh it's the perfect tie right so uh yes. robbie yeah robbie's tasks are, are are answering those phone calls and emails and track site support uh but one of the cool things he does and uh we can talk about it a little bit if robbie wants to down the road uh, a little bit later we've had some um webinars where he's he's kind of focused on it but the custom uh wiring for data systems and the chassis that's a mm -hmm. that's a pretty cool thing that uh, that he and others do here here at aim sports and and uh and he showed some of those on uh, some of the many times he's been co-hosts in the past so thank you robbie for being here and uh maybe you can add just a little bit more about what's going on with you before we get started well i am uh in virginia right now visiting the our uh, Virginia location and hanging out with all of the technicians here. It's been, it's been just great fun being with a new set of guys that have the same passion that I have. From here, I'm going to go straight to Wisconsin and we're going to do a big off-road race, one of the biggest short course off-road races um, in the U.S. So 50,000 entry or 50,000 spectators um, and 1,300 horsepower trucks with four-wheel drive going as fast as they can. It's, it's a, uh, it's mind blowing how much dirt they, those trucks can move one of um, my uh, i came from the off-road racing world and it's uh there there's just not too much more that's uh, pretty cool to me i will uh, i also am going to travel to a race this weekend i'm going to go to the uh indycar event and support uh indy cars indy lights with the smarty cam products uh gps sensors at uh at portland international raceway this weekend so uh, i get to travel to a race as well so 
Perfect, Robbie. Let's uh, let's stop the share, and uh, and and let's let's kind of chat a little bit about what uh, where you're going to head with with where we're heading today. You're going to talk a little bit about obviously the hardware. What um, what other kind of stuff are are you planning? And kind of an overview before we jump in and share your screen. Um, a lot of times the PDM can be daunting. Um, you have you have like a blank canvas when this PDM comes to you, and and um, knowing where to start, how to start, and how to be the most efficient with your time is, I think, the, the first step in taking that, that leap into a power distribution module is uh, organization, planning. All of this happens before we even get the PDM in our hands. I have, I have a, a harness schematic done, established, and it's on the test bench, and I'm, like, I'm ready to plug it in when a PDM arrives, but I've also built a configuration. I have a lot of the logic that I want that I want to work. And then it goes on a test bench and I have to make sure that that logic is actually working the way that I want it to. Um, so my goal today is really just to kind of introduce my method of going through a configuration and how I can seamlessly, how, where I used to stumble and how I how I got around that and and just tips and tricks that I, that I picked up along the way. Yeah, Robbie does a lot of these, and, and not only uh, ones that he set up and, and worked on with with uh, with racers, but uh, also chatting with with users and, and and helping them and sharing with them some example configurations, things like that. I think Robbie is going to make available. You're going to see some examples today, and he's going to walk through some, and uh, and I think he's going to make that available for us as a as a link that uh, uh, that if you want to grab it, open it up in your Race Studio three and 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 have all you know the the examples that he showed here today available for you to play with right so mm -hmm. perfect robbie if you uh if you uh, in fact there it is in the chat box now and of course uh, later in, uh, in in youtube you'll uh, you'll uh, have the ability to download that as a zip file and then uh, unzip it and have that available to you so robbie if you want to share your screen we can uh, yeah, we can see. take a look at it and hit hit this hard okay so you guys should all be seeing my screen now seeing it just great thank you Okay, perfect. Um, if we run long, I have a couple of these webinar configurations that I've already built. So we're going to, I can just kind of pop in and out of them. Uh, this one is completely blank. We haven't started it yet. So we'll start here. Uh, and I just wanted to go over some of the, some of the benefits of a PDM. Why, why would you choose a PDM over conventional switches and relays? Um, and for me, the, the main reason is the logic control that you have. Uh, you don't need to conventionally change the wiring to get a different result. You can go in and electronically change the, the, the control. And now we have a completely different result. I've changed nothing in the wiring. So for me, it's a lot easier. I can do it from a laptop and I have completely different results on the race car. Uh, so it's, it's incredibly powerful. And I, I know we said this a lot, this one will, uh, your imagination will be the limiting factor. Um, the, the status variables, the logic control that we have is, is even more powerful than our existing MXL2s or MXGs, MXSs. So if status variables are slightly changed, power outputs now have logic trigger commands. We can, um, and what we're gonna try to touch on all of those today. So what I wanted to do is just briefly kind of introduce you to the PDM. It's an electronic solid state device that allows us to distribute power um, based on predefined logic. If my water temperature is high, I want to turn my fan on um, and I could do that with a button. I could also do it with a temperature dependent variable and I could do them seamlessly together. So if my driver forgets to turn the buttons on, the the automation of the fan is already taken care of. He really doesn't need to do it unless he wants to override my logic. So we're going to build in some logic um, for manual override. We're going to build in some automation logic, and we're going to kind of see how this develops and how long it's going to take me to do it. So I wanted to touch briefly on the channels, which is very much similar to the channels that we have in the, uh, the MXG and the MXL2s and the, the systems that you guys may already be familiar with. We're going to set the analog or digital options. And the analog side is just what it, what it is in, um, in the MXX hardware series. So we can assign an oil pressure. We can assign the type of pressure sensor that it is. We'll use 0 to 150. And we have our sampling frequency unit of measure, all very similar. Now, the PDM has an internal 
pull-up resistor that can be flagged. So for temperature sensors, two wire sensors, medios, temperatures, uh, we can actually implement an internal pull-up resistor to simplify the wiring even more. Now we're not building an external pull-up circuit that's in a connector or maybe tucked into a transition in your harness somewhere that, um, that may have to be edited later if you wanted to run another channel. I can just software select my internal 2K pull-up. Uh, I've used this on, on several temperatures, uh, but I want to focus mostly on the digital input. The digital input, uh, these analog inputs can be converted to digital. So we have the eight analogs, and then I have four that are purely digital statuses. These cannot be analog channels. They can't be temperatures. They can't be pressures. They are their buttons, their switches, their things that just change state. So what we're going to do is we've already kind of assigned our, um, we'll set this up for fuel pressure. And we're going to go into our channel nine. I like using these for, for simple switches because that's their only purpose. I can use these, but I, these also serve double duty and they allow you to run a temperature, a pressure position. So let's save those for, for the horsepower that they can do. Let's yeah, again, use. again, a big part of your planning, right? You have the ability to use some, some channels that are, are one use only, the very powerful use, but one use only. Why would uh, you, the planning is such that you would really want to use those for, for what they're designed for? Leave those other ones open for, for your imagination, right? Continuing exactly. with that if, same thought process. And if you need them, you can repurpose them into digital inputs. So if you're not running eight analogs, you can purpose them into more switches, more buttons, more user control uh, of the power distribution. So today we're going to be developing a momentary switch. And I wanted to touch briefly about the physical mechanisms. We, well, there's a lot of different buttons and a lot of different switches. Um, so understanding how it mechanically works is the starting point. Is it a button that, ha that has a normally open, normally closed? And as I hold the button, it it's, it's closed and as I open the or let go of the button, it's open. Or I can have a latching button where I push it and it locks into place. That would be more like a toggle. So it has a uh, two defined positions that don't require me holding it. Uh, understanding that mechanical aspect is gonna help you set this status down here. So for our example, we're gonna use a momentary button that I simply, I push it and at the, for the time duration that I'm pushing it, the circuit's complete this is going to go to the on status. The second I move my hand, it's going to go to the off status. So I can actually just create this. I can create a momentary button. I can also use a momentary button as a toggle. Now we're going to do this in a status variable so I can have two different uh, functions of the same button. Uh, and then I can also set a multi-position. So every time I hit the button, it advances to the next state. So if it's off, it goes to on, or it can go to position two, and these can all be renamed. So if you're doing map selection, this could be, you know, map A, map B, map C. And every time I push the button, it's going to advance till it gets to the end and then go back to the, the original map A. So it's circular. For today, we're going to use the momentary. Now, I personally prefer my buttons to be ground activated. To do a ground activated button, it's very important that I implement this internal pull up. It's going to charge the, the state of the, the signal. And once I apply a ground, it's going to overcome my weak pull up resistor and it's going to pull the status of that down and it's gonna pull it low to ground. So now I have, I have a definitive change in state. So that is done by simply selecting this. If it's closed to ground and you have no voltage on it and it's off state, we won't read it. We have to see the difference between those two positions. Uh, close the battery can be done it's without the internal pull down because we have, a, we have a voltage and then we when we open the button, we no longer have a voltage. So it can be done, it takes a lot of time uh, and we're talking milliseconds, but it takes time to bleed off the, the voltage from, from this button. So where I'm gonna push this button, I have 12 volts. And if I don't pull it down to ground, then I don't get a good shape out of that button. My, my off period is, is dwindling and it's, it's gonna discharge itself slower. So it's best to use this. Um, so we're gonna enable our pull up, set it to a momentary because the button is physically a momentary. And we now have, set up an analog channel 
and a momentary switch. And we can continue setting all of these up as we uh, as, as needed. So my next step is I like to assign a display. So I, I handle my channels because I know I'm going to be plugging all my channels into this. But before I go any further, I'm going to assign the display that I have for it, whether I, if I don't have a display, in this case, we're going to use a 10 inch display because we're going to uh, we're going to make some trigger commands for duplicating the buttons, which aren't available on the 10 inch display. So we're going to choose that and we can, this is all that we'll really be doing with the display tab. We have a couple of videos that that go deeper into the, you know, how to how to manage the channel groups and the, and the channel settings. But for now, we're going to set this to a 10 inch display. And my next, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, my next option is to get into um, my keypad. So am I running a keypad? Am I running a Rio module? I'm going to set that up right now. Before I've touched anything on my power outputs, I'm going to establish all my user interface controls because I have to have these user interface controls before I can write my power logic. If, you, if you're going back and forth and building one power output and then coming back and assigning a button and then going back to your power output, we're wasting time navigating through the software. It's just good practice to set set up all your variables and all these things, and then it makes it much easier to write the logic out from, from pull down lists, right? Basically. Absolutely. And you'll notice that I, I put an SW at the end of this. Um, and, and the only reason I do that is to organize, um, organize my where it's coming from. Is it a switch? Is it a keypad? Is it a status variable? Is it a, a trigger command? And in the power outputs, I can understand where that data or where that signal is coming from without having to open it up and see the channel group that it's assigned to. So I'm giving myself a, a visual cue um, in my power outputs. That's why I'm adding this switch here. And I do the same thing for my keypads. When I come in and establish my keypads, I want to set a siren. Um, and I'll do KYD. I don't know why I chose KYD. It's me that says keypad, um, but maybe KP. Um, but it's just it's just a it's just a way for me to know that this doesn't come from my digital inputs. It's coming from my keypad, and now I know where to correct it. Robbie clearly comes from an off-road desert racing world. No, no other motorsports would siren be the name of a of, of one of your keypad buttons, right? But uh, in off-road racing, you you push that button to let people know you're behind them. Um, so. Now that I'm here in my keypad, we can we can kind of start flushing out how we want this keypad to function. So I, I go to my CAN2 keypad tab and I'm going to enable the Blink Marine, um, the keypad. Now the keypads, we can we can stack eight or four, eight different keypads onto a PDM. We can have four different eight button keypads and four different 12 button keypads if you need that many buttons. A lot but, of uh, expansion there, certainly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to enable by by default the Blink Marine keypads that we're that we're utilizing. They come as ID fifteen for eight buttons if they're purchased from us, uh, and uh, the ID nineteen is the first twelve button keypad. So these these come to you pre programmed with these base IDs. If you want to run two eight button keypads, we have to we we have to change the keypad um, node ID. And it's it's a little complicated with with can and just a little bit of forward thinking, knowing that you're going to run two keypads, talking to your dealer, they're going to let us know that we need to have two separate IDs and we're going to ship them that way. We're going to label them ID 15, ID 16, so you know which one does which. All right, so let's get into adding some of these keypads for, for this. Um, we're going to open up this this one right here where I pretty much flushed out almost everything. So we have the momentary switch, we have fuel pressure, um, we have the 10 inch display, but my keypad, I've, I've kind of already gone through and written everything out for us using KYD identifiers. And you'll notice it looks a little different. So when I come in, I establish that my fan is on, my fan is on key one, which is found here on the Blink Marine keypad. So I know which one to activate it on. I know what it's going to be doing because I put in there that it's a fan and it comes from my keypad. Now I'm going to program it just like we program a switch. I'm going to program it as a toggle because I want it to latch. I want I want to be able to push it and have it go into the on position and stay in the on position until I push it and toggle back to the off position. So it's called a latch. Um, and I want to assign I want to assign some buttons to it or some colors to it. So for that, I'm going to double click on the color side. And here I have a priority arrow that 
will allow me to set different color commands. <clears throat> it allows me to set these different color commands so I can have um, different variables. So I'm actually going to edit this one a little bit while we're here. What you'll notice is that when the fan keypad um, is in a state of off, I want the value to be white. That's, that's how I do a backlight. So I know that the keypad is on and that the button does something because the backlight is now white. And when I activate it, I get a visual cue, the keypad turns green. I know that the keypad is now on. If I wanted to add another variable, I can click on the gear icon in the top right hand corner and I'm going to do add new output state. It's going to stack another, um, another variable on here that allows me to control the priority. So I want this to be on. I want the fan keypad to be off when it's white and the fan, this one, we're going to move to the top position so I can maximize the priority. And I'm going to change this to an error report. So I want this to take the utmost priority. And I'm going to say when this fan keypad, I may be going a little fast for you guys. So let me, let me walk this through here. Um, I'm going to click on the, the logic that defines the color. And I'm going to choose from a, always true, always false. And I have a, a variable here. This variable opens up everything that the PDM is doing. So I have all of my, my groups of channels. What does it come from the ECU? We're going to direct this to the power output. And now we're going to look for some of the, the power outputs I've, I may have flushed out already. So we have fan speed. We're going to use that for right now. And I'm going to use the speed status. This is the status of the power output channel. And for this, I want it to be different from OK. So I have wow. OK, short circuit, open, high temperature, overcurrent, under voltage, and over voltage. These are all flags in the data uh, that we can record. But I want to be, I want the, the user to know that they have pushed the keypad and it is on, but the power output is not on. So now that's giving me a red command. So if it's different from OK, I know that any of these variables are triggered. Whether it's a short, we're, we're going to have to go into data afterwards to figure out why it's done this. Was that list but, generated by you, or is that a list that is uh, uh, available uh, as, as just part of the normal stack? Every power output has this type of, that uh, pulled of up control to it. Yes. Because those yeah. are the normal faults that might happen mm -hmm. in an electrical Absolutely. circuit. OK, perfect. So, so now if we, if we look at our priority, we're going to start from the buy up from the bottom. If the fan keypad is off, it's going to show a white light. If I turn, if I manually turn the fan keypad on, toggle it and latch it into the on position, it'll be green. And if the power, it basically, if the power output is active, and if anything happens to um, the power output and it flags anything different than an OK status, the value will turn red. So that Perfect. is interesting. An, now, I also have a couple of momentary, so siren, starter, these are all momentary commands. I, I want to hold them down, and I want the power output to be on until I've released my, my finger. I don't want them to latch on, especially a starter. I don't want my starter to like latch on, and then me have to latch it off. So <laughs> no, that, 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 that would be moment. bad as part of your imagination piece. The, um, <laughs> uh, if, if I go back just, a, just a 30 seconds, that fan mm -hmm. that you have there, there is a perfect example of Robbie's uh, or, and other racers have imagined an, uh, in their mind a problem that would may happen. And the fan, you may turn it on, it may go to green, but if there's a fault, that's really important for the racer to know that. And, uh, and that is part of that whole imagination thing that Robbie has said, okay, well, yeah, that's important. How do we build something that will allow the racer to know that I've pushed the button, but it hasn't activated enough or there's something wrong and the fan's not actually working. And, and that um, just part of that whole imagination is, is the limit, something Robbie started with. And this is just another great example of that. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, it comes it comes from necessity. We, exactly. I didn't know my fan wasn't on. Okay, well, exactly. Then we're the light on. So now you you if you see it and it's red and you know it's not on, <laughs> we need to do something else. Um, so for my multi position, um, this one's for lights, and it's actually defined with three different variables. It's off, and and the position zero um, or the rest position is going to be how the PDM boots up. So if we notice we had the same thing with our toggle here, we have a rest status. Every time the PDM turns on, this button will be off. You can actually use that to your advantage. 
So you can use this as, a, as another state. So when the PDM turns on, I want it to be map A and then until I go to map B. And then we can send CAN data. That's where, where you would enter in different values. I can send specific CAN data to my ECU now to get into map A or get into map B based on the value that I that I put assigned to these. There's a little higher level stuff um, and I, we, can, we can go deeper into um, some of the larger builds that we've done. But for now, just know that this is the, the boot up status and this is the activation status. So this is the user interface. Um, for the multi-position, we have the same. We have our rest position is going to be our position zero. It's off, has a value of zero. And when I short press it, it's gonna turn on my low beams, which my low beams have a value of one. When it's in low position, I can short press it and it will advance to high beams. High beams have a value of two. And when it's in high position, I can um, short press it and it goes off. So this is like a circular pattern. I just get, every time I hit the button, it's gonna go from off to low to high to off, off to low to high to off. Now, I may want to flash my lights. So I have a, um, a timing variable that I've also added into it, simple check to enable or disable but I'm going to use this timing control. And I'm going to say that if I hold this for 0.5 seconds, it's actually really, really long and do something like 0.3 seconds. Um, then when it's off, I can go straight to my high beams. Uh, just a, an, an overpass of low beam activation and go straight to high beams, um, which is it's a, it's a nice a nice feature that you can just kind of build into it. So you don't have to go, especially if you have six or eight different different activations or uh, positions that you need to cycle through. So you want the cycle there unless you long press it and then you can advance to a very specific target. So if I long press from low, I want it to go off. And if I long press from high, I can actually direct this to off as well. So now from off, I can go straight to my high beams or if I short press it, I can go to my low beams. From low beams, I can short press it, go to high beam or if I long press it, it turns it off. And, and so this is the type of logic that you're going to play around with. What works best for you uh, in, in your application? What do you want it to do? And, and how can we manipulate these logic variables to, to get you there? It shows that it can be just a basic button or mm -hmm. in the three different ways, the momentary toggle or multi-position, or it can even become even smarter than that by, uh, uh, again, your imagination. What, what, uh, how would you like it to operate? We've given, uh, the software is giving uh, the user lots of options. Yeah, and, and being able to select like what your long press does given this state. This state yeah. has two different positions that it can activate depending on what I do with the button. And of course, this takes some some talking with the driver and like them understanding how this keypad button, and maybe you're the driver. And that's exactly. perfect. You get to design it and you get to implement it. Yeah. Um, okay, so now we have lights that are going on um, straight to high beams. Now the siren is just momentary, so there's nothing special going on here. It's just an activation and it's going to activate a power output. Starter is the same. Um, and if I need to excite the ECU, maybe I want to be able to download data, but not have my ECU on my ignition system, on my, my injectors with, with power. I want to just have the PDM be on so I can download data and not drain my battery, not have to keep a battery tender on it. Um, so, so for this, I would, I would have an, an actual ignition control. I can turn other functions on with this command right here. And then we're going to add some previous and next. These ones, we've done a little bit of uh, um, trickery. So I, I call this previous keypad, but it's really the left side of the conventional buttons. Uh, if you're not familiar with our displays, uh, there's two buttons on the left-hand side and two buttons on the right-hand side. When we design the 10 inch display, there are no buttons. So if I still want my menu control and I still want to navigate through the, the, the onboard memory, you know, look at my best three laps, look at my maximum RPM, I want to, I want to duplicate those buttons. So I'm giving myself two, uh, three variables. I got my rest state is off. When I push it, it's going to give me uh, a short status. And if I long push it, reduce that to 0.3. When I long press it, it's going to give me a, a long status. And so this would be my left hand side buttons. I, I call them previous keypad. And then my next keypad is going to be my right, right hand side buttons. Um, but they're set up the same way. And I have different uh, I have different color variables so that I know it's just visual cues. They're momentary and your finger is going to be on it. So you may not even see these 
actually happening, but when I short press it, the keypad will turn green. And if I activate a long press, it'll be amber. So that that's the keypad in a nutshell. I mean, for me, it's, it's identifying that all of these um, user inputs are coming from my keypad. That's the most important takeaway that I want all of you to get all of you guys to see. Perfect. Okay, let's see. Now I, I think we can go straight into variables. Uh, While you're getting that set up, see. Matt Matt had mentioned something a little bit earlier uh, that that kind of tied into what you were just uh, saying there. Uh, he said, um, um, make sure to, to turn on recording for the power output states. Everything that Robbie Brilliant. just showed there was just kind of setting up. And I know Matt knows this, but was setting all of that up, and then uh, to be able to pick when he is building these states, right? So uh, now he's going to go in there and he's going to start these uh, to look at some status variables, and now you're going to see where we can record uh, these things if if desired. I was just re reading through the chat, and just yeah, latching latching siren. Um, yeah, would it surprise you if I told you that I've done that? <laughs> On purpose or on, on accident? No, on accident. Uh, okay, we, okay. <laughs> it just it enabled the siren kicked on and we could not turn it off. <laughs> we were like looking for dead switch, like we need to turn the power off. <laughs> Cause they are uh when you say siren, they're they're like that kind of loud. So it's uh, crazy. Oh, yeah. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna navigate, we're gonna kind of skip over some can expansion and, and some math channels because I feel like we have some really good videos that that already go into some of this. Uh, so I really want to focus on some of my status variables. Yeah. And a lot of these I use on almost everything. So if we go into um, my fuel and I, I label it SV, so I know it comes from my status variable section. If I need to edit it, I know where to go to find it and where to edit it. Um, so for this, this is a fuel prime and a running command for my fuel pumps. Now this has no safety in, embedded into it right now for, for sake of time. But so right now, if you read this, it, it has a momentary control. So this variable will be true or false if the conditions are true or false. That's what the momentary means. If it toggles, then when it's true, it toggles to on. When it's true again, it toggles to off. Like it's, it's creating that latching command that we were doing with the buttons. Uh, Multi-position is the same thing. It gives us it gives us different variables that we can then kind of write in. You know, this is selection one, selection two. So these status variables can get very crazy very quickly. Um, so I just wanted to show how you could use something like safe ignition to prime your fuel pump. So every time the PDM turns on, we're going to prime the fuel pump. And then uh, I'm not going to touch the fuel pump until the RPM is greater than 50. I should be able to achieve that by activating the starter. So I'm going to crank the starter. Once it gets to above 50, my fuel pumps are going to kick on. My ignition's already ready to go, and we're going to fire. And then it's just going to run until the engine is uh, until the engine's back down to zero. Once the engine gets turned off, you know, you kill the ignition, um, then the fuel pump shut off. I don't have a fuel pump whine sitting there like in the, I mean, usually it's behind us, but uh, it's just sitting there whining and, and trying to pump fuel. Uh, so for the safe ignition, this is an internal channel that the PDM is managing. So we have power directly from the battery. It's constant and it's always there. So we have an ignition input to tell the PDM when to turn on, when to turn off the safe ignition is that channel. So we would come into the source and we go to internal and select the safe ignition option. We want this different from one. One is the, the on state, the PDM is on. So when it's different from one, this is going to be true after five seconds. We can set equal to, actually I think would be better. Um, and it just depends on how we set these activation statuses, but essentially when the PDM turns on, this will be equal to one after it's verified for five seconds. So that means I have to be on for five seconds. That's my fuel time priming mechanism. I'm going to, if I, if I needed three seconds of fuel priming, I'm gonna set this truth value to just three seconds. Um, so if the safe ignition is on, I turn the key on, it goes to safe ignition one. After three seconds, this becomes true. So I have to think about how I'm going to handle these two statuses because it will be in rest status for three seconds um, until, until that stipulation is true for three seconds where it goes active. So I think that's why I had different from, different from yeah, one. Exactly. 
It's so, funny how you, you started to walk your way through it. That was interesting. You, yeah. uh, you actually, you went through the logic in your mind and you, uh, you picked up exactly why you had said it the way you had for different yeah, and, from instead of equal to. And it can be, it can be, your, your brain can, can be, you got to think, yeah, you have to think. Just, yeah. For me, sometimes it's even a bit of a piece of a paper for, to, for the first couple, right? And get your mind yeah. thinking the way yeah. that the electronics are, are thinking. Rarely ever do I go straight from a PDM in the box to putting it in, in a car. There's yeah. so much, it never works the way I want yeah. <laughs> in my brain, yeah. the way yeah. I think it should. And then there's small tweaks that we're going to be making throughout, yeah, throughout all of this. Um, so if this safe ignition is different from one, um, and it's true after three seconds, three seconds, um, then we're going to do a rest command and an active status. Now I can point to this active status because after three seconds, this will be, um, this will move to inactive, or if RPM is greater than 50, this is going to immediately go to active. So engine cranking, run the fuel pumps. At the beginning, when the, when the system initially boots on, I want them to, uh, to prime. So that's where the three second timer is. That's how you it's virtually like, like every running. every production car that's out there. When you turn your key on, you'll always hear the, the fuel pump come on for just a second and goes <laughs> off. Yeah. So what you've really done here is just kind of built it like a, like a production car. Right. Because it's what it's motors need. It's what motor yeah. exactly. That's what the motor needs. It needs its fuel pressure ready. Yep. So now I'm going to um, I want to show you something that was uh, it took me a little while to wrap my head around this one. I have a momentary button, which we set up earlier in the webinar, which was just like as long as I hold it, the, the value is on. And when I let go of that button, the value is off. I can actually take that and create a toggle from it. So now I have two different functions of this button. I have when it's on and the momentary aspect, and then I have a toggle that latches it to an on position. And when I press it again, it latches it to an off position. And we can play, we can play around with, with different ways to get different outcomes by just changing the button function. I like to set them up as momentary because it is a momentary button and I may need that in the future. So I set it up in my channels as it is. And if I need to change it to a toggle, I create a status variable to now create a toggling uh, math channel that we're just kind of calculating. Every time the button gets hit, we're going to take it to the opposite status that it's in. If it's active, we're going off. If it's, if it's off, we're going active. Um, so now I can use this as a toggle without having to, without having to change anything in my channels tab. Now, I also have some fan off status variables. These are, again, momentary. Um, and we're going to say that when the ignition keypad is on and the starter is on, I don't want to run my fans. I may not have enough cranking amps, um, especially on big trucks. We're running eight, nine fans. <laughs> um, and, and if they snub the motor and they're on the track and they're fan, the, the, everything that I've told the power outputs to do is going to keep the, the temperatures down. So those fans are going to be on when the PDM turns on and they're going to be trying to cool it. And I need to run a starter. That's going to take a lot of cold cranking amps to run, to, to get this hot motor spinning again. I'm going to set up the status variable here. I can write this in the power output logic, but I do it in my status variable because I may have several fans that are going to use this logic. I only want to write it once. So I write when the ignition keypad is on and the starter keypad. So the ECU is in an on state and I'm running the starter. Those fans are going to shut off until I let go of the starter command. And, and I'm going to have all the, the potential energy from my battery for starting the motor. Perfect. Yeah, you're writing something in one spot and then just calling it out in, in, in multiple different spots. People have always asked, what's the, what's the power of a status variable compared to, you know, some of these other things we, you, that, that are available to us? And, we, and now you're starting to see why some of these things have been built. Uh, while they're powerful in the MXX series uh, to do certain things like this, they're really powerful in the, in the PDM logic world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, this is a flashing command. And this is actually supposed to be momentary. Um, and I use this for, for uh, alternating light flashes. So uh, I need to notify the people in front that I'm behind them. And I, you know, in off-road trucks, we have a siren, but in road cars, we have headlights. Why can't I alternate my, like, I, I want to flash my lights on. I want to get their attention in any way that I can so that they can get out of my way because I'm going faster or hopefully, <laughs> hopefully going faster. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll take a user input. In this case, it's the siren. I like, I like attaching it to the siren in the off-road trucks. And I'm going to create a square wave signal. So this has a duration status of on, 
and hydration status of off. So while this is true, while I'm holding the siren keypad button, I'm going to be toggling between an on and off state. This is how I'm going to get the lights to alternate their, their pattern. It's by using, by pointing to it when it's on and pointing to it when it's off. So I'm going to generate, I'm going to simply select this, generate my square wave, and I'm going to set the duration. Now you can play around with the on status can be 0.3 seconds and then it just blips off. Usually I do 0.1 and 0.1 because I want as fast of a strobe as I can get. Something to really catch our attention. In, in the road racing world, maybe this is a pit, pit road speed limiter, right? So your lights Absolutely. flash when you're when and that's actually active and you're coming down pit lane. Absolutely. Yeah, actually, we, we use that quite a bit. And uh, I always go back to desert racing. But but when in desert racing, when you're trying to locate a car that all the, all of them have lights and they're all shining in your face, you have to have some way of like, hey, I'm coming down, like get, get ready, yeah. you know, flag me down. I can have a unique light sequence that's happening that as I'm coming in, they, they can recognize me out of the sea of other lights. Uh, endurance racers in uh, after dark is the same kind of a thing. Obviously. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So this is all this is doing is creating this square wave right now. That's all it's, we can use it. We can not use it. Um, but this is how you would generate a, a alternating uh, variable. So this is true. Now alternate your position on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, like a digital square wave. Okay, so we've we've tackled our status variables. We've we've set up our keypad. We set up our display. We've gone to our channels, and you can see how much work has gone into this. And we haven't touched a single power. <laughs> haven't built anything yet. <laughs> we yeah, we, we haven't. The, the thing is still not even functioning. It um, is a lot of work, but it but a lot of uh, but it, it's so powerful that it's the. It's the way this process should be built. You should be sitting down and thinking it out because it's going to make the next couple of steps so much easier. Yeah. So the, the last one, um, this is similar to how we how we did the keypad and how we did the uh, the momentary switch. Uh, the trigger commands allow us for uh, direct access to to display functions or menu options. They, they make it really simple to access these these parameters. So I like to use the trigger commands, and of course I label them TC. So I know that they're part of the trigger commands tab. Um, so for this, if you remember, we had the previous and the next uh, on our keypad. And they had, they had three different positions, off, short, and long. This is how I'm going to simulate the off button. I'm going to, when I push my previous keypad, I'm, I, want, I want to simulate my off button when previous keypad is equal to on. If I open here here up, you're starting to stack these commands you've, you've written, yep, right? You're showing the, exactly. the power of, uh, of some of that previous work. Absolutely. So I need to, I need this button to do double duty. Um, when I, when I short press it or put it to on, and these can be renamed. I can do this like short and long, or I can do on and off or S1, S2. Um, they can be renamed the, uh, the previous keypad equal to short press uh, or on will activate my, my next or my off. Um, that's the bottom left button on, on a normal display. Now, if I, want to access the menu, which would be my top left button, that's going to be my previous keypad equal to long. So if I push and hold it, now I'm going to be in the menu. And now I can actually navigate the menu by short pressing the same button. And it's going to, it's going to move through the menu commands for me. So picking which one you're short and which one you're long is, uh, it, it takes some, it takes a little bit of time, a little bit of testing, but there, this is, this way works really well for me. And it seems to be more intuitive. So I have two buttons. I need to make four buttons out of them. So and you know, with the with the new Smarty Cam three, we we've gone to a two button, you know, uh, change the menu item and then short and long mm -hmm. pushes on the Smarty Cam three. Right. So there is some uh, um, correlation there to that event as well. And then I have the same thing happening on the left hand side of the buttons. I have an on view button, which would be bottom right hand button, um, and that's just a short a short key press um, will activate the on or the view button. So that's going to advance my display pages uh, forward. And my short press of the previous keypad is going to advance my, my de-advance my pages um, um, to the left and right. I don't, I don't know why I was thinking of them as left and right, but yeah. Uh, and it's and not just for the ten-inch screen that doesn't have buttons. Sometimes you, you've, no. you've, 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 we've mounted those things where the driver with their belts on can't get to those buttons, and they might want to, or the co-driver. And uh, having this ability is is powerful for for all different makes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I've done the same thing. Then my next keypad equal to long will activate my memory. So if I want to look at my top three laps or if I want to um, select within a menu, I have to long press my next keypad to activate this OK button or the memory 
the memory recall button. It takes a little while to get used to, but you will, um, when you only have so many buttons, um, it this simplifies is, this everything. Is the type of yeah. logic that you're going to do, right? Yep. So I think I think we're ready. We're ready for power outputs. Um, so we're going to set up the uh, we're going to set up a, a high power output, and we're going to. I've already kind of gone in and set up high beams and low beams, and I haven't I haven't done any of the programming for them yet. I've just kind of given them names so I could I could call to them um, in my in the keypad stuff. So for for those of you that are interested. Um, the high power output one is is going to be dedicated for starter or starter solenoid activation. It has a built-in series diode, which is going to help prevent a lot of the snapback voltage that we're going to get from when a starter relay or a starter solenoid uh, magnetic field collapses. That all comes back to us, and it becomes incredibly uh, uh, dangerous to our oh, hardware magic. because yeah. yeah, because we might we might see something like sixty or hundred volts coming back to us when that when that magnetic field um collapses and we need to protect it that's going to be dedicated to high power one so let's set it up double click on it um, and we're going to give it a name starter and these i don't i don't use any any type of mechanism this is my starter my power output to my starter so i'm not going to put in like po or anything like that these are just these are they are what they are i don't want it to be pulse width i want it to be a continuous activation of power and because it's a motor, it's an inductive load. So I'm going to make these selections just based off of what I'm powering. This is all the, the hardware that you need power is going to define how you're going to uh, set the, most of these settings up. So we, we rock into uh, continuous power, inductive load, and we're going to click on this. And this is really similar to our logic. Uh, we have always true that we've done in, in the, the button commands and, in keypads, but we have always true, always false, and variable. So we're going to select from my keypad, and I want my starter keypad equal to on. I want this power output to be on for as long as my keypad is uh, starter output is a, is in. So that's why this is a momentary button. And if you notice, if this was just starter. Um, I would have a conflict in names, but I also wouldn't know where it came from just by looking at, at this. I would have to come in and click on this and figure out that it came from the keypad and this is what I, what I named it. And that's why it takes so much time going through and labeling um, where all the user inputs come from. It helps you in, in the future for, for maintenance and, and fixing and changing something. You know, like maybe three seconds instead of five seconds, you know, you can find it very easily this way. So, um, and then this would be the electronic fuse for the PDM. So I have up to 20 amps on this power output. Um, if, and then this is a starter, I would, I would run it at 20 amps. Um, the overlatch current is how much time that we will allow you to be up to double the rated amperage, right? So for half a second, I could be at 40 amps before I'm going to break the connection and I'm not going to send power anymore. That's it's going to happen electronically. So at 20 amps, uh, I can go up to 40 for only a brief moment. You can have um, a spike. It's not you, we, exactly. Typically, so typically things do spike a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When anything turns on, it's going to require more than it does when it's warmed up. Or there, there's reasons to have this. And a lot of people call this uh, overlatch current or inrush current protection. Inrush current. Um, so the number of retries, if it fails. I can set a retry strategy. If it's really important, like a fan, um, I want it to retry. I don't want it to to just be dead and then be dead for the rest of the race. So I may set or fuel fuel attempts. pump, right? Or fuel pump, right? <laughs> fuel pumps, right? I may I may yeah. I may bump my, my exactly. retry attempts up to twenty, and then I can set the time delay between retries. So if it's something uh, like a fan and I know it's going to need to cool down, I may set my time quite long. So I can run without a fan for a little bit, but um, but I can't run indefinitely. So let's set let's set our retries to like twenty seconds. Um, let's set it to ninety nine seconds. Cool. Yeah, twenty. Um, and then the minimum current. This is uh, if if the the system requires some type of minimum current to uh, to keep it awake, keep it alive, a low level state. I can actually program that in there. So when it's off, it's not actually off. I can send you know one amp down it as well. 
if it so needs it. I would, if it needs it, rarely ever. I, yep. To be honest, I don't think I've used this yet. Um, so that would be how, how we develop. That's a walkthrough of, of a power output. And this one's a little bit simple because we know everyone kind of knows we um, we have momentary button and we only want that to be on uh, for activating the starter. The second I let go of it, it needs to kill the, the command to the starter. Now we're going to, because I think we're a little pressed on time, we're going to go into the, the completed one and we can just talk about some of the power outputs. And the completed one is the one that you have made available the for folks? It is. Yeah, that's, okay. the, one, that's the one that everyone linked out there. Okay. Um, so I wanted to show how I did the, the low beam, high beam control. Um, so for this, it's a little bit interesting the way you have to think about it. But um, when I select pulse width modulation, I have a prioritized logic now. So much similar, similar to the way we did the keypads, I have a priority of events that, that will take uh, precedent over the, the following. So if I turn my keypad uh, lights too low, it will activate this power output unless my flashing status variable is in an on state. And then it will, it will basically go into and allow my flashing variable to toggle on and toggle off, toggle on and toggle off. So um, that priority so is a key in, in mm -hmm. uh, certainly in the, in the PDMs, we see it a lot, but you've seen it, uh, those of you that are had just standard, you know, aim MXX gauges, you know, when we try to work on, on the dash layouts, that priority becomes real important for alarms and dash layouts as well. That's where you've seen it before. And it's certainly being used here. Yeah, it's, it's heavily used throughout the entire PDM. And in this situation, I'm actually not using pulse width modulation. I've set my duty cycle to 100%. Yeah. Um, so this is this is a continuous power output, but I need prioritized logic for this, and I don't want to build it into my status variables. I don't want to create this heavy calculation based status variable routine that I could do the same thing with all the logic that we have in here, but it's computational load. This is an, a simple, elegant solution that that solves the same exact problem in the same way, and it takes half the time, less than half the time to, to produce. Um, so if I have both of them set to 100%, uh, 100%, then I have a continuous load. And only when my keypad is on will they be on, and less I have my flash status variable equal to on. Now, same for my high beams, except I have a little bit more of a command logic in here. So if my keypads are equal to high, um, the, the high beams will be on. So it's a different power output. Now, if my keypad is if my uh, flash there's status variable is equal to off, I want to send 100% pulse with modulation. I want to turn the high beams on. The status variable is off when it's 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 off in two states because it's it's constantly cycling between on and off in that square wave that we were talking about earlier. Uh, I have to put a further command in here that says when the flash status variable is off and my siren keypad is on. Now I've actually engaged the flash status variable routine and it's gonna to toggle between on, off, on, off, on, off. And that's how I'm gonna get an alternating pattern between my high beams and my low beams. So when the flash status variable is on, my low beams are on. When the flash status variable is off, my high beams are on. But my siren keypad has to be in an on state for that. And that, then they're just gonna kind of bounce back and forth, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. And Perfect. I still have the, the regular, yeah, the regular functions of a, of a, of my my buttons. You know, when I hit, when I get enter into high beams, and we have the multi position to where I can advance directly to high beams. All of this is is still here, unless this is happening. And again, you've you've set this up by setting up these these keypads and these status variables. So now, when you actually get into the power output, there's a lot less logic that needs to be written here because you're able to go and call out some of those other values, these other things you've set up in the in the past. Absolutely. And, and actually, I have an example for the, the fuel pump. Uh, in this situation, I may need 30 amps of power, but let's say I don't have 30 amps uh, available to me. Um, so I'm going to combine two 15 uh, amp outputs. And this is one of the major benefits of the status variable is I, all that logic with the fuel priming, and maybe I have a button override, maybe I have a second fuel pump. Um, I can now just point it to my fuel status variable. My, my programming of my power outputs, I like to keep simple um, unless, unless I can't. 
<laughs> so <laughs> the uh, the fuel status variable is equal to on, and we went through the fuel status variable. It was it was the safe ignition uh, to prime the fuel pump, as well as the engine rotation above 50 RPM is going to activate this channel. But I have two channels running the pump. I don't have to write the logic twice. I just write it once and point each one to the fuel status right. variable. Now both of them will turn on at the same time. Perfect. Perfect. It shows the power. And then uh, kind of on our way out, we're getting pretty close. I'd like you to mention maybe fuel pump is a good one to do it on or one of the fans where mm -hmm. we where we record these values for, for later use. Uh, right, right now, you've been setting yeah. it up to when the power goes and where and how long and how much. Uh, but we, we have the ability to record this information mm -hmm. if it's set up that way. Can you chat about that a little bit and why that's important? Absolutely. Uh, so there's, there's three check boxes that you you have to know. And on important channels, fuel pumps, um, fans, anything that you want to manage, you're going to have to know where these are. So this checkbox right here, this record values, this tells you the state is, is the power output on or off? And that's going to be it put into your data if we select this record value. Uh, then if we have a tab here that says related channels, now I have two separate related channels. I have the current that is that's being required. Um, so I'm sending, maybe I have 20 amp fuse, but it's only pulling 15 amps. Uh, so I need to monitor how much uh, current that's going. And it's really beneficial for fuel pumps. So you can track a, the health of a fuel pump and get ahead of, of, a, of a fuel pump change out and not be stranded on the track because your fuel pump, as it ages and as it wears, it's going to, it's going to take more and more energy to uh to to get the same result so we're going to enable i want to track this i want to know what it's like when the fuel pump is is brand new and healthy and i want to see how it degrades over time and eventually it'll fail on me and i'll know when i need to i'll look at back in the data historically and say okay this is where i should probably do a a fuel pump change in the future so it's something that i manage i can actually probably create a routine in race studio 3 to help me like if it's over this you know show me show me a red variable on on my uh uh, my measures graph. Um, and then we also want to store this value. If you're having a problem with a channel and it's happening intermittently, it's on track, uh, it's it's difficult to ask a driver. It, they're they're going to see a red button. They're not going to know why. We're going to store this value and we're going to store these um, we're going to store these numerical values in the data, a 32. If, if I have a power output, my fan speed goes to 32, it's over voltage. If my power output goes to 16, then I have an under voltage problem or an overcurrent or a high temperature and open uh, open circuit or a short circuit. And if everything's okay, it'll be one. These are simple checks that you can just turn on. And if you see anything outside of, of zero, like you have a problem, you have a problem somewhere. Uh, and it, it, you may not even have noticed that it happened, but it did. And that's when you're gonna start checking connectors. That's where you're gonna start checking wiring. And these uh, store values, uh, record values and store values, they, they are off by default, right? So when you first are. open up a channel, you, you mm -hmm. go through the process of setting it up. You need to make sure you settings and then related channels and set these things up if, if it's some Absolutely. data that's your, that you're interested in. Absolutely. And, and especially the, uh, um, I, it, it's not, I wouldn't do it on every channel. There's some like uh, USB power or yeah. uh, dome light or thing, things that I, they don't matter if they're they're not mission critical things. And, and it's just going to make my data files even bigger. So by default, everything is off and it's up to you guys to go in and say, this is really important. I want to know everything about this. Let's let's record all of this data. So we have historical um, data for it. Using that imagination again, and your and your uh, learned experiences, right? Uh, understanding that fans and fuel pumps and what, what, these different things that you can see when the power demands are growing, that you know it's time to to take a closer look. It sure, certainly is uh, helpful to have that information to to do your uh, post race analysis or post session analysis. Do you think we have time to go over pulse width modulation? Let's let's talk about it real quickly, and then we'll move uh, okay. we'll move to close up. So here I've set a fan speed. This is a brushless fan. It's a, a small, um, a small fan that's actually wired directly to the battery. Um, so it's getting its power on its own. It's my responsibility to, um, to control the speed of the fan. And I like to completely automate this um, because drivers have enough on their plates to worry about. They don't need to be worrying about pressing buttons or and I don't want to clog up their mental faculties, let them focus on racing. So uh, I'm going to stage the power, the delivery of my pulse width modulation to the fan to control the speed. So I set my 20, I 
enable add new output states to get as many as I think I, I'm going to need. And I'm going to say when uh, when the water temperature is greater than 160 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm going to start my duty cycle at 25%. It's going to slowly spin that fan. And it's it's really nice for when you get to a, a stoplight, a production car, it's not just going to kick your fan on it at 100% and blow dust everywhere. It's, it's, it's going to slowly build its progression. At 170, I'm going to bump it up to 50%. At 180, I'm going to do it to 75%. And then at 190, where I know I make the most power and I want the motor to be, I'm going to do everything I can to keep it there. Um, so I'm going to, I, sometimes you can't do 100%. The, the brushless fans don't like it. Yeah. So you're going to have to, you're going to have to figure out the highest number that you can reliably run on those. Um, and, and here I've actually done engine coolant temperature greater than 190, which follows suit yeah. for what we've done before, or if I have a manual override. And that's, that's a user defined that comes from our keypad. If the driver thinks that he needs to get ahead of some cooling, or if he, if he just wants to, the peace of mind to know that his fan is on, he has a direct way to, to go outside of my automation. Override it all and just say power, max, max, max power. Yep. Let's go. Exactly. Exactly. So again, again, we, we the PW, a PWM such a yeah, PWM just, such a powerful tool, and and you just showed real quickly, and I know you had to rush through it a little bit. Sorry about that, but you, um, okay. it's such a uh, powerful part of the PDM where you can actually program all those steps in and make it an automated process. It's uh, so so powerful. And and I don't know if everybody's been looking, but some of the things like we have Square Wave here, we have Square Wave in our status variables. There's a lot of different ways that you can solve the same problem. Um, I mean, there I could write this same logic in status variables and then just point to it. I, there's, there are, there's no real right way to do it. The goal is to be the most efficient and streamlined as possible. So if you need to come back in, you're going to know that, okay, so this button's not working. Okay, I know that's from my keypad. Now I can go back to my keypad tab. You want to be able to read this simply so if you have a status variable that's dependent on another status variable that's dependent on a button channel tracking it backwards is much harder than building it i mean yeah. it, it when people share them with me it's it's just like okay what were you thinking um okay, <laughs> you're trying to okay you're going in this way in this way yeah yeah the the, the ability to go back and and maintain this and tweak it uh, mm -hmm. is 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 greatly enhanced by having those named. So, uh, and one other thing, and Matt mentioned it a little bit ago when we were talking about the amperage draw on, say, a fuel pump. It's not just when the fuel pump is going bad; you got a filter starting to oh, plug okay. up, and that fuel pump Absolutely. is having to work harder. Now, all of a sudden, you've trapped an error that uh, your fuel, you know, your fuel filter is getting dirty. You can catch that before your engine starts to miss during an event. It, so, so, so much power, or, uh, either one, right? So. So much power here. If you understand what you've set up and ways to read it, and you've stored the right data, you, you your uh, your data guy's jobs get bigger and bigger. But the the value to the to the race car, to the team, to the finishing positions is is high. So, and, anything and else you'd that, like to add on the way uh, as you're kind of closing that out? Yeah, the 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 ability to change is is one of the major powers of the PDM. So I can come back into this configuration and change the function of like, I, I don't want my high beams. It, normally I would do this with, in past years, we would do this with a conventional relay and I'd have to go back in and, and rewire my relays and maybe even run a different uh, wire up to there. And if you wanted to make a change to a built race car, it just got messy yeah. here. I can just come in and elegantly change. Okay. Well, I mean, this is my power output for my high beam. I don't want to flash these anymore. I'm just going to turn it off. I don't have to go in and disconnect anything and make sure that my connections aren't going to short on the chassis or it's, it's electronic. Or you decide you want to have put in a lower fuse fuse, cold right. fuse, right? You just throw yeah. in a 10 amp uh, setting in there yeah. and uh, yeah. because you found the wiring was getting warm or whatever, and boom, you've just resolved a problem. Uh, save the configuration, resend it back in the PDM, you're off and running. So the, the power of editing and maintaining your electrical system is, uh, is amazing. So I know we haven't uh, uh, hit, but just a couple of things we wanted to start off pretty basic and we wanted to get in at least to a couple channels and a couple of per, you know uh, status variables or trigger commands and show you some of the power um, and i know we couldn't do it justice uh, at the deep level 
we do have in my, in our minds to come back in a, in a in a few months in another one of these and do one that's all about power outputs or one that's all about status variables and, and dig in a little bit deeper and uh, and have these videos available so when people can come in and can watch some of these we've had some links in the chat where they've they've talked about where we have had other videos where we have focused on status variables in the uh, in, in the normal aim dash displays and where we have uh, you know dash loggers and uh, those are available for you the links are in the chat they'll be available down in the uh, uh, in the description of this youtube video later as well so there's some things that robbie has kind of talked touched on that we have covered a little bit in the past we'll try to make those links easy for you to find so robbie anything else you'd like to kind of share on as we uh, before we unshare your screen um, no, I, I think where I'm ready, I'll, I'll give you control back here. Um, perfect, perfect. And I do want to, um, I mean, if, if it would be interesting, I, I find myself using CAN a lot. Now, now that we have a power distribution module, there's things that need to go to ECUs or transmissions or, um, and there's, there's similar to what we did here, there's, there's ways to not get lost um, in, in sending all of this data around. And if you guys would be interested, I mean, that could be a, a CAN PDM webinar where we're using CAN output, we're changing values of our keypads so that way we can send the correct data to where it needs to go for map control and things like that. Uh, it, it, gets, it gets pretty complicated and we should probably do a refresher maybe on some CAN stuff, rewatch the webinars, and then we can dive into deep, deep dive into that. Well, your your imagination has gotten better. Your learned experience has gotten better, uh, and as well as everybody else's. So yes, we ought to update those and and create some new ones. But um, uh, so much power there, and, and obviously we can't do a ton of you know give it a real justice here in the first uh, first hour of, the, of some of these. The links will be made. Robbie has given us a couple of can uh, webinars in the past. We'll put those links in here as well, so you can go back and watch some of those. And um, but I but I think we're uh, we're going to continue on with these plus plus data analysis and other Ray Studio three uh, topics here in the in the near future. I appreciate that, Robbie. Let me share my screen, and let's see. Let's let me move. I have you up in front. Let me make sure that. Yep, I have you. Mark. Move that out of the way. There we go. The uh, I had you in on my main monitor. Um, to kind of close this out, uh, number one, thanks everybody for coming again. As usual, this is uh, this has been great fun. I uh, I uh, always learn so much, and I know you guys do as well. And it's it's great to have people like Robbie here, and all of the gosh, probably forty or fifty different co-hosts we've had over the course of these these uh, 150 webinars we've had uh, ha have shared their knowledge. It's just been fantastic. Um, this video, as well as all of those previous 150 and many other videos that we have on our YouTube site is available. Uh, I'll get this up just as soon as I can. It usually takes an hour or so to get this uh, um, through the YouTube maze and, and, and get it up and, and placed up there. So you'll have that soon. Go visit the, the, our YouTube site and, and do a little quick little searching and you can find uh, just tons of information that we have available up there. So the, um, uh, one of the things that we, Robbie and I talked about, Robbie's gonna be in, in Crandon, Wisconsin this weekend. I'll be at the Portland Car Indy event. Uh, all of our uh, AIM techs will be somewhere. Uh, take a look for us if you can find, um, if you see any of the AIM backpacks or, or uniforms or the vans, uh, make sure you, you say hi. Give, uh, give Robbie a, a tall, uh, tall water there at the Wisconsin event. <laughs> it's always warm. Uh, the, um, uh, but uh, it's really what we do. You know, we're a customer support company that happens to sell electronics is the way I always like to put it. And um, it, it's just so important to us to, to, to support all of the folks that are using the products and, and help you get the most that, out, of, uh, out of them that you can. So look for us or give us a call or email or whatever it happens to be. Happy to help at, uh, at all times. So um, next webinar, uh, we're, we do these the last Tuesday of every month. Uh, that uh, the next one happens to be September 27th. Uh, again, we, uh, I, 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 with, with us doing them monthly, I don't want to set a, set a hard schedule like we have done in the past with the weekly ones. So it's to be determined, but um, we will be here on September 20, 27th and we'll talk about uh, something that we have found uh, has some need to be discussed. So if you have... Yeah, exactly. A little bit of, little bit of uh, mystery. <laughs> and number one, mystery. And number two, it gives us some flexibility too, right? Uh, from my end of it, uh, yeah. to, to cover what is needed at the time. So please, if you have some ideas, just um, 
the uh, drop them to me at uh, roger at aimsports.com. Uh, you can even send them to Robbie if you'd like. He'll he'll forward them to me, I'm sure. The um, uh, there's the contact information. Uh, Robbie went over some stuff pretty quickly today. Obviously, we'll have it out on video. You can uh, you can play it back and 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 see his clicks a little bit clearly uh, if if you need to uh, pause and go back and take a look at him from the video side, or if you have some questions, drop him a drop him an email down there at uh, our yeoman at, uh, at aimsports.com or, or uh, for any other information that you'd like to get from me, there's my email address. I appreciate uh, all of you coming. I appreciate uh, all of our co-hosts and especially you, Robbie. Is there anything else you'd kind of like to, to add as we're kind of closing this one out? No, thanks for letting me come on and, and hurt some brains. <laughs> I love you. Absolutely. <laughs> such such power and such knowledge. And uh, so so, uh, so uh, thankful that you've come here and help us. Uh, and we will have you again in the, in the near future. So thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you uh, next month. Talk to you soon.